Not a chance in the world. That phrase came from the diary entry of a babysitter who met me at one and a half years old. He couldn't see a future for a young boy in the care of an alcoholic mother and an absentee father who would ultimately be lost to gun violence. I was taken from my mother when I was just three years old, and I would never see her again. There was no family for me to go to, so off into the foster care system I went, where placing me became quite a challenge. I didn't know it at the time, but I had been born into a generational cycle of pain and suffering and loss. And complicating this need to place me was my very appearance. I was a young African-American boy who often had a blonde afro, blue eyes, light complexion, and a Polish last name. Although I am proud to report I have since grown a neck. Questions about your identity, who you are, and where you come from are often accusations, especially when you want to know just as much as your questioner does. I didn't know, and I didn't have anyone to tell me. So often to the foster care system I go, moved from one home to another, none of them particularly good until I find myself in the particularly cruel clutches of one foster family who received commendations for the children that they take in over the years, 39 to be exact. But there was nothing commendable about this home. They lived in a world of guile and deceit and manipulation. They kept painting this picture of me as a broken boy. And for a while it seemed that this prediction of not a chance in the world was actually going to come to pass. I think a lot about that phrase, not a chance in the world. It was said of me, it's been said of some of you. And even some of us in the quiet of our own heart have thought that as well, something we see, a situation that's a challenge or difficult. We think, yes, there's not a chance in the world that this is going to get better. And what that says is that there's no hope, that the way this is is the way that it will always be. But I refused to accept that. We feel that way most about the world that is around us today where everywhere we turn there is negativity and dissonance and cynicism. Hatred and violence become part of the way that we engage and interact. Division is actually something that sells, but it is never something that solves. Hatred and violence have never solved one meaningful thing in the world, nor can it solve the challenges in front of us. But I have hope, and you should too. And the reason that we can have hope, we should have hope, is because of what I encountered in those early days when it seemed all was lost. Things changed for me because of these small human interactions that I had, things that bent the arc of my life. And without them, my life is completely different. I've come to call these interactions human lighthouses because the people who interacted me with me were just that. They were human lighthouses. Now, as a young boy, there was nothing I loved to do more than read. Reading, to me, was this great mystery, but it also gave me vision and values and a sense of purpose and place in the world. But in this foster home that I am in, they have terrible and insidious rules, and one of them is that I cannot be seen reading in their presence. Books were really hard for me to come by, and reading actually came often at great risk. But that was where I met my first human lighthouse in the form of a neighbor who encountered me reading across the street from that foster home. She somehow noticed that I had been reading the same book over and over again, and she asked me whether or not I should have been done. I said in response, well, when I get to the end, I just go back to the beginning and I hope that I read something new. She says nothing to this and just walks away. But later on that night, there's a knock at the door. And it is this woman standing there with a box of books that she brought me not only that day, but many days in the decade that I lived in that home. Claire Levin 
is her name, and many years later, I would have the opportunity to talk to her and tell her just how important she had been to me, a real human lighthouse. Another lighthouse came for me in the form of the spelling bee judge, who every time I spelled the word correctly, I could see her out in the audience, and every time I spelled the word correctly, she would look at me with this enormous smile. That smile said, I see you. And not the circumstances that you've come from over which you had no say, but the great future that awaits you over which you're going to have every say. I would encounter her many years later when she was the director of a college access program into which I had been admitted. And once again, Ruby Darton pointed her light right at me. Even to this day, Ruby still looks at me the same way she did when I was in elementary school. You never forget who sees you first. And Ruby really did see me. A third human lighthouse came for me in the form of this man, John Sykes. John worked for Ruby in that college access program. The Foster family was trying to pull me away because they knew that that program was actually giving me even more vision. And they tried to pull me away, and I had to sit down with Mr. Sykes and explain to him why I needed to stay, despite their efforts. As I walked away from that meeting, I overheard him say to another counselor, I don't have any children, but if I did, I would love for them to be a lot like that young man who just left here. Two years after that, I am seated across from my social worker two days after Christmas. I arrived in his office at 11 o'clock in the morning, and at 5 o'clock I am still there, and I have been watching him over that time calling families trying to get somebody to take me in. But I am amongst the most difficult kind of child to place. I am 16, I am black, I am male, and I have this case file following me around that says, not a chance in the world. And in a moment of pure desperation, he says, my social worker says to me, do you know anyone? And I almost said to him, well, isn't that your job? But I knew he was trying to help me, and I fumbled for a moment, and the only person I could think of was Mr. Sykes. And I said to my social worker, I think that there's this counselor who likes me. So the deal was that I was going to stay with John for the week between Christmas and New Year's. Well, that week became a month and then ultimately became my last year of high school. John was the one when I presented him this problem of how I was going to get to college, especially when I couldn't afford it. He said, you should apply for scholarships. I said, what's that? He said, that is free money. I know what that is. And in my zeal to get to college, I applied for every scholarship I could get my hands on, including a scholarship for left-handers. I am not left-handed. But I was willing to be. He sees me doing this, and he, he sends to me a scholarship. He says, I really think you should apply for this. And as soon as I looked at it, I knew I had absolutely no shot <laughs> at Daughters of the American Revolution. And they rejected me as I predicted that they would. And when I showed him the rejection letter, he said, that's not right. I think we should write them back. I said, and say what? He said, ask them if they're sure. So I did that too. I wrote them back. Are you sure? They wrote me back. We're real sure. <laughs> We're not changing our rules for you. So I was told no a lot, but I was told yes just enough to make college a reality. Claire Levin, Ruby Darton, John Sykes, they had this real-life superpower. It's called recognition, and it actually drove gratitude. They recognized something in me, and I will forever be grateful that they did. Without them, the arc of my life is completely different. I do think a great deal, as we all should, about the dissonance in the world. And we ought to be asking ourselves a harder question. How do we move through that? How do we get beyond? I think one of the places that we can begin to do that is in the environments that we work in and live in and operate in. Think about the course of your week, whether it's a classroom or a place of business, we spend the majority of our time in these environments where connection and community and collaboration happen, where even the very things that appear to divide us are actually opportunities to learn. So we can connect, we can better understand, we can unify. Because you never really do know the power and the impact of a moment of recognition, what that can do for someone in a particular point 
in their life. And I offer that up not just because of my own experiences, because in my role as chief people officer at Work Human, we power the platforms of some of the world's most admired companies. We drive the ways in which employees recognize other employees. We start in a place of positivity. Over the years, we've been able to see millions and millions of interactions across a multiplicity of cultures and languages, and yet there's one consistent thread. Positivity and gratitude can bend the arc of cultures and communities. It can provide unity, connection, and understanding. We see this in the world of business as an example where turnover is actually cut in half when employees recognize each other over the span of 60 days. It actually can create a more inclusive environment when women, the LGBTQ community, any other demographic group is recognized and included as they are without exception or without equivocation. But you don't need any advanced degree to be grateful. It's a superpower that we're all armed with. You can do that actually as you leave here today. You can hold the door open for somebody behind you. You can actually greet the bus driver or the flight attendant, return their greeting. You can ask the server what time her day began and most importantly, what time will it end? You can send a handwritten note to your human lighthouse, someone who touched and impacted your life. Because behind a cheery greeting can lie a struggle that you know nothing about. That's probably what I was thinking about uh, when I decided to respond to this letter. It came from a fifth grader in a town in Massachusetts. His babysitter had recommended my book, for him to do as part of a class project. And apparently he did really well. And then he wrote me. And I was so amazed that a fifth grader decided to write to me. And what his letter in essence said was, I see something of myself in you and I am grateful for your story. As soon as I saw it, I said, you know, I have to go see him. I have to go see him. And so that was my plan. I was going to surprise him but it would be I who was in for the surprise. I called his teacher and said, I want to come see Julian, and I don't want to let him know I'm coming. I just want to show up. And she said, well, I don't think we can quite do that. We're going to have to plan for this. And then as educators I want to do, you, you give them an inch and they take a mile. And she said, so since you're going to be here, would you mind talking to the entire school and not just his classroom? Of course, I said. She said, I just have to get permission from the principal. The teacher and the principal meet, and the principal says, no, I don't know this man. I've never heard of this man. I don't know if this is going to be a good fit. And the teacher is taken aback by this and says, well, I'm going to bring you his book tomorrow. Read it over the weekend, please, and then let's have a conversation on Monday and revisit this discussion. That was their agreement. The next morning, the teacher walks into the principal's office, hands the principal the book, walks out, and she's barely through the doorway before she hears the principal say, oh, my goodness. Well, I would love to have him here. The teacher's taken aback and says, but you just said no. Don't you want to learn a little bit more about him? And the principal magically says, I don't need to. I was that man's second grade teacher 40 years ago. So I did go see Julian and his teacher and my teacher. You see, when you bestow recognition, gratitude comes back and perhaps a loop is closed. It's a powerful example of a lighthouse, what it does, and there's no more powerful example of that lighthouse than young Julian with whom all of that began. Not a chance in the world. Boy, did that turn out not to be true. And if I had one picture to show you that that was not going to ever come to pass, it's this one. You see, I did find family after all. And it wasn't what I was born into because sometimes family is who you find along the way. This is my wife, Tanya, of the last 22 years, and our children, Quinn, Vaughn, and Kennedy. This is my favorite photo. It was taken a couple of years ago, and so my boys want to make sure that you know that they are now officially taller than their father. 
Kennedy, last in the birth order, came into the world and promptly staged a coup. And she reminds the boys all the time, it doesn't really matter who's taller. Little girls are always tallest in their daddy's hearts, which is about right. Nobody thought that this was possible for me. Not a chance in the world. But now you know better. I'm here. This exists. This family, this end of a cycle of a generation exists because of the power of gratitude and recognition. Those human lighthouses that came to touch my life. That's true for you too. Somebody saw you. Somebody saw not a circumstance but a possibility. Somebody looked beyond labels. Somebody fought for you. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody saw a new beginning for you. That human lighthouse is an opportunity for all of us to be. It doesn't require anything other than the smallest of interactions. Think about what a lighthouse is. It's tall. It's immovable. The lighthouse does not negotiate. It does not ask your race, your gender, who you voted for, who you worship, or how many Twitter followers you have. The lighthouse says because you are here, you are worthy enough. I meet a lot of people in the course of my travels who are in the middle of a struggle, and they ask me, what do I do? And I say to them unequivocally, set your sail for the lighthouse. It's out there, you know. It may be off in the distance, and you may have to sail through a storm or two to get there, but the lighthouse is there. I believe that as a young boy, and I believe it now, and I believe that because I believe that you will be that lighthouse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.